Hey everyone, um, my name is Satesh. I am one of the co-founders of uh, Algovera. Um, Algovera, we've been researching uh, what, uh, what it means to decentralize AI and how to achieve it. Uh, we've been doing this for almost two years now and uh, we'd like to share some of the thinking, some of the applications we start building and um, some of the research exploration that we've been doing. By the way, we're going to be covering a lot of content in a lot in a very short space of time. So we also have a workshop at half four, uh, which goes which we can go into more details uh, of any of the things that we chat about here. So one of the one of the thinking uh, perspectives that I want to sort of share with this audience, the scientific community, is this view of thinking about AI as a medium to augment human intellect. And I'll specifically focus on this uh, second part because there's like two parts, which is the medium part and the second part, which is the augmenting human intellect part. Um, and a lot of the work on augmenting human intellect came from uh, this particular man, which is Douglas uh, Engelbart. Um, and this was sort of um, the motivation for doing this work was when he sort of realized the complexity and urgency of human problems were growing faster and greater than our capability to deal with those problems. And that's what sort of kickstarted the, the, the work on, on, on human intellect, augmenting human intellect. Um, and I should also mention that Douglas Engelbart was one of the early pioneers of personal computing. He painted the whole sort of vision on personal computing in the 60s. So just to kind of give you an intuitive sense of what it means to augment uh, human intellect, um, I'll give you the definition first, which is uh, the idea of using technology to enhance and extend capabilities of human mind to improve the way people think work together and solve complex problems more efficiently. And a good analogy or like sort of a, a way to think about it is, um, you know, what happens if we augment uh, human intellect in, and take a step backwards in, in actually improving our human intellect? So something like this would, um, would be if, if you were to strap a brick onto a pen and every time you had to use a pen, you had to use it with that brick. Imagine how slow that would be to sort of write uh, and to sort of um, have discourse, have review, uh, uh, you know, uh, form uh, criticisms of uh, people's work and, and share that uh, and, uh, share that sort of analysis. Pretty soon, it's going to get you know slow in terms of the intellectual progress that we can make. Um, and you know, th there's another point of that in that the way that we interact with these tools can also change the way that we think. So actually, using using a pen that is attached to a brick slows down our thinking in that it takes so long to actually get our thoughts onto paper and um, sort of manipulate our thoughts, uh, it becomes much more of a, a slow process in actually being able to think. And that's why when you get sort of the ability for the digital media where you can go in into certain parts and, you know, uh, and start forming uh, your thoughts there and edit it and copy and paste, it just opens up a whole new way of, uh, of um, sort of thinking and working um, and so I'll go into a little bit more into the conceptual framework that uh, Engelbart kind of uh, put forth. Uh, so this is the basic, uh, you know, human, uh, you have some uh, co conscious part, you have some unconscious part, you have perception, you have motor uh, abilities, uh, perception to get, get information from the outside world, motor, motor abilities to um, manipulate the outside world. Um, and then human societies developed complex systems like languages, customs and tools so that we can deal with larger tasks and problems. So, you know, you have like the uh, language forming um, skills being acquired and then also uh, tools that you start interacting with in, in the outside world. Um, and um, one of the things that you can think about is uh, separating out this complex uh, systems that we've, uh, we've actually um, formed into human systems and tool systems. And what's really exciting is uh, we have like this two new forms of uh, technology, innovation uh, that really can change both the human system and the tool system. One is the, uh, the maturity in AI we have uh, as a potential tool to, uh, to, tool to augment our, uh, our, our abilities in human intellect. And the other is sort of the human system. And I, that's why I'm particularly interested in sort of the DAO field, which is sort of reorganizing the way that we do work and collaborate, which is, I think, more in the human system side, albeit it's, it's sort of uh, aided by technology. So we really need to think about how we can uh, boost our capabilities as individuals and organization to deal with a more growing um, complex world. Um, and we think uh, sort of AI and uh, DAOs and crypto is a really uh, great combination to start thinking about uh, new ways to augment uh, human capabilities. 
So Richard will uh, talk some uh, more about some of the applications that we're doing. Um, so I'll hand it over to Richard. Hey everyone, so I'm Richard. I'm the other co-founder of Algovera. And what can you see here? Oh. All right. Okay, so yeah. Um, yeah, so Hitesh explained a bit about the motivation for why uh, we're building what we're building. And I'm gonna kind of change gears a bit and talk a little bit uh, at the practical level. Um, what can you do today to augment, uh, augment your capabilities uh, personally and also uh, of communities? And so I'm gonna talk about personalized chat GPT uh, for communities. So first of all, um, oh, this is an old presentation. Um, so first of all, why do we want to uh, personalize chat GPT? Um, why not just use ChatGPT online? And the reason is that, um, you know, it's, it's useful when we're using these assistants for the assistants to have context about what we want to do. So some of you will be familiar with this. If you want ChatGPT to perform a certain task, such as writing an email, for example, um, maybe you'll give it some context about the person that you're writing to, or maybe some context about the history of the conversation or whatever. Um, and so what if we could, you know, use uh, knowledge bases that, you know, a, a lot of different communities are building in Web3 um, and use those um, to di and dynamically bring them into the prompts when, when we're interacting with these models. So that's why we want to personalize these. And um, so there's a few different approaches for, for how we can go about this uh, in order of like hardest to, to easiest. And um, so some people still train language models from scratch, but uh, by far the most common is like fine tuning at the moment. There's a bunch of people exploring reinfor reinforcement learning uh, with, these, with these models. Uh, but something that not a lot of people talk about is prompt engineering. And I really think that prompt engineering is a paradigm shift um, because for the first time, you don't need to do any training whatsoever. And you can just like be clever with the prompts that you pass into the model to elicit certain behavior. And so this is what most people think of when they think of prompt engineering. Um, this is a prompt that you might put into like a text to image model, for example, writing, you know, Unreal Engine Ultra HD to try and get the, the image perfect. Um, and honestly, like when I first heard the term prompt engineering, I thought it was a bit of a joke. Um, but then I dived under the hood and it kind of blew my mind uh, just what was possible. So um, the reason that we need prompt engineering is that large language models are really good at general purpose uh, text generation. Um, but as I mentioned, sometimes we want to generate data based on specific context. And so this, uh, this is one form of prompt engineering called re retrieval augmented generation. Um, and you can kind of think of this like a two-step process. So uh, the first step is like knowledge retrieval. And then the second step is to like do some sort of generation. Um, and so like we just use the LLM for it's like language modeling component and also like maybe so some reasoning as well. Um, Okay, so let's say, for example, we, we wanna use our knowledge base with, uh, with an LLM. Um, let's say we have some docs. What we can do beforehand is basically embed these docs and, and, and store these in something called a vector store. Um, and then when we ask a question to the model, we can embed that question as well. And then we can see which docs it's closest to in embedding space um, and maybe retrieve the four docs that are closest to us. And these should be the docs that are most relevant and most similar in meaning. Then we can insert these docs into the input prompt along with the question and then pass that into the language model so that it you know, not only has the question, but it has a bunch of rel relevant context that has been uh, brought in dynamically. And it's not just like knowledge bases that you can uh, do use with the, with the input prompt. You can think of this like a knowledge module that dynamically retrieves um, knowledge, but you can also do more stuff. Like for example, maybe based on the question, uh, you realize that you should like pull in some Google search results, or maybe you want to use a calculator um, or maybe you even need to like run some physical simulations and then pass the results into the input prompt as well. So there's a bunch of like dynamic stuff that we can do in this input prompt. Um, and you can start to think of this input prompt a bit like a program. So um, this is like, this is a way that you can use existing Notion docs to create a proof of concept for a personalized knowledge assistant in less than about five minutes. Um, so all you need to do is export your docs. Uh, you need to run a script in jest.py to like embed all of the different docs. And then you can run QA.py to run this pre-built prompt engineering workflow, um, uh, which, will, which will work uh, and pull in data from your, uh, from your docs. 
So I did this with the Aldevera notion. Um, I, like I said, I built this in less than five minutes, and then I just started testing it and asking it certain questions. So I was really impressed with this. So for example, what are Aldevera grants? What hackathons does Aldevera run? What is the link for joining the Aldevera Discord? What topics have Aldevera talked about in reading groups? Um, and an, an interesting one is like, what is the history of Aldevera? It said, I don't know. So it didn't hallucinate or make up some information in this. It actually, um, it said, I don't know, which is great. And that's because that information wasn't uh, actually in the docs. So I've just showed you a use case for like something like a community management assistant, uh, which was built using our community notion docs. But we also have other notion docs like we we're fundraising at the moment, so we have like an investor wiki. And so I thought wouldn't it be cool if we built like uh, an assistant that can help us pitch to investors and I can just send this to investors and they can ask a bunch of questions about you know around and all that sort of stuff. So I've built that as well, and um, we also have like a consultancy brochure so i'm thinking can we build a consultancy bot that like answers questions about prospective clients and the one that a lot of people might be interested in here is something like a research assistant. So um, one of the hackathon winners talked about ChatGPT for research. Um, what if like we built a ChatGPT that could dynamically pull in different research papers um, or maybe some other stuff? Maybe it could run simulations, uh, do some calculations. Um, the possibilities are really endless. Um, so we're still we're still building this. We've got like a bunch of POCs, but like what we really want to do on our platform is to hook up a bunch of data sources. Um, so we want to hook up, you know, Discord, Discourse, Obsidian, you know, maybe Discord, Discourse graphs, you know, maybe YouTube videos. Um, and we also want to integrate Web3 data sources as well, <clears throat> like data sets on the Ocean Marketplace, IPFS, Ceramic. Um, we want to like connect archives so they can dynamically pull in that. Um, a really interesting thing about doing this uh, retrieval augmented generation as well is that it's quite easy to reward the authors of the people who wrote the docs, right? Because we're retrieving like the four closest docs to, to a question. Um, if your doc is used to like answer a question in a community model, maybe we can give out rewards to the people who, who wrote those docs, for example. So that's uh, really interesting as something like ChatGPT that actually rewards the contributors to the, to the knowledge base. We're also working on like interfaces and even like UX improvements like memory. So ChatGPT has memory about the previous questions that you asked us, so you can ask follow-up questions. We haven't integrated that yet, but it's something that we're working on. Yeah, so we're basically building a platform uh, where you can create, deploy, and orchestrate uh, a bunch of different AI assistants. You're able to like connect different data sources like uh, through APIs and stuff like that. We also provide consultancy services for building these AI assistants. We have a microgrants program for funding proofs of concept, um, and we have an active community in general for um, for pushing for decentralized AI. And so if you're interested in like building some of this stuff, it's possible today uh, and we'd love to collaborate uh, with you. And now Jakob's going to talk a bit more about some of the research we do on decentralized AI. Awesome. Hi everyone, I'm Jakob and uh, today I'd like to give a short overview of the broader meaning of decentralization in AI. So this is the outline of today's talk. First, we're going to talk about what decentralization actually means in the context of AI. And then we're going to dive into specific examples like decentralized computing, data. Then we're going to take a look at decentralized model building and workflows, which is at the core of what we're developing at Algovera. And lastly, we're going to briefly discuss the significance of decentralized AI within AI research and DSI. The core of Web3 is decentralization of both different technologies and societal artifacts. And the same goes for decentralized AI. Here I've broken the problem down into three categories that we're going to dive deeper into in the coming slides, namely the infrastructure layer, i.e. how is the model trained? Is it trained on one GPU cluster on AWS? Or is it trained on a distributed network of devices that have some kind of consensus mechanism that maintains data privacy and security. And similarly for data, is it stored on just one server? Is it stored on IPFS? Who has access to it? And so on. The next category is engineering, which I would further subdivide into model development and deployment. Model development in this case relates to the way that data scientists and developers use the underlying infrastructure to build new AI models and products. And model deployment is about both how the infrastructure is used to deploy AI models, and at the same time, uh, how the end user is interacting with the AI models, which relates to topics like composability, AI workflows, 
and rethinking the AI business model altogether. Uh, lastly, we have the societal impact of AI decentralization, which I would further divide into the human AI interaction and then into the pure research category, as in how can the decentralized AI stack help increase research output, collaboration, and participation in the AI and DSI community. So let's take a look at these sections more closely. Decentralized computing is probably uh, one of the most rapidly advancing parts of decentralized AI. And along with data, it's probably the most important part of the decentralized AI stack because it ultimately represents a move towards a fully decentralized cloud where resources such as GPUs are more accessible to individuals, researchers, and early AI startups. The Web3 side of decentralized compute introduces a trustless way to train AI models and have consensus within communities or even the wider network on the usage of the compute resources. And this is also related to topics like AI governance and even AI research. And you can imagine certain communities having semi-private compute clusters within, the, within a wider network but that is perhaps used for a singular purpose, like training a specific LLM on incoming text data from Discord or anything else. The other side of the decentralized infrastructure is the notion of decentralized data. And with it, the various protocols for decentralized storage, as well as data sharing, provenance, and the retaining of ownership of different data assets. Decentralized data is connected to decentralized compute through projects like IPFS as the uh, last presenter talked about because Bacaliao is building on top of IPFS and also other data protocols like Ocean Protocol, which creates a number of ways of selling data fairly uh, without losing ownership and also running compute over data. So this would be a very brief overview of the decentralized AI infrastructure. And now we get into the higher level overview of the system and we consider how that infrastructure is used for the development of AI models. I would argue that this infrastructure uh, allows for a completely different way to build AI models. For instance, you might need to build your models in a modular way to account for the fact that your training data might be distributed. And the same goes for training and deploying on distributed compute infrastructure. Because of the underlying Web3 components, it may be also possible to decentralize the entire AI business stack and it allows for people to focus on specific components of AI development so that you don't have to build an MLOps team and a DevOps team and an R&D AI team every time you want to, you have a new idea you'd like to explore as an AI startup. Of course, you'd probably want to do all these things as you scale, but at least in the early stages, you could use existing components of the pipeline that are built by members of the community who can now continuously earn income on their models and tools reflecting their utility over time, instead of treating AI development as a kind of one-off trade where the engineer gets a salary, but really no ownership of the tools they create. I think this can really increase the level, the level of collaboration within AI and move us slightly closer to the vision of fully decentralized AI Legos that you can just play around with and sometimes stumble upon something new and useful. This goes hand in hand with how uh, the end user is interacting with the AI models. When you have AI Legos, it is suddenly much easier to build many different workflows that automate tasks that would have otherwise been too complex to solve. This is at the core of the flow platform that we are developing at Algovera, which we hope can, on one hand, provide a space where developers can add many different workflows and get rewarded for doing so, and at the same time, a space where users can easily use these workflows in their day-to-day -day lives or easily build new ones from the existing components. In the last minute, let me quickly go over what this might mean for AI research and DSI. And I like this meme so much, I added it twice. Uh, <laughs> I'd say the two biggest value adds of decentralized AI to DSI are uh, on one hand, decreased barriers to entry in terms of getting training data and decreased costs of training ML models, and at the same time, an increased incentive to collaborate within domains where data privacy is a fundamental concern. So less grant funding is being spent on acquiring data and training ML models, while at the same time, researchers are more incentivized to collaborate. I think another, there's another point in that because of these decreased barriers to entry, 
this allows for a much wider exploration of topics within contemporary AI research that aren't currently as developed because they don't perhaps have the clear cut commercial ap ap applications that make them attractive for grant fund funders. And this may equally well be a consequence of just onboarding more people to DSI and incentivizing them to collaborate. Basically, I would say that decentralized AI, same as DSI, has the potential to greatly increase research output, accelerate research, and democratize the process of scientific discovery. And I'd say that's pretty exciting. Uh, so with that, I would like to extend the invitation to our decentralized AI workshop, which has now been extended by 30 minutes. So we have a full hour to just talk about decentralized AI. So I would encourage you to come if you have any thoughts or just like to chat. Thanks a lot and enjoy the rest of the conference.